Welcome to Perspectives on Leadership and Investing While Having Fun with two from Two Decades on Wall Street, part of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. Today's webinar is offered in valued partnership with Tech United New Jersey. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors are helping to raise awareness and funds for the 1000 Laptop Challenge. Our students and their families have experienced financial hardships as a direct result of COVID-19. And the move to a remote learning environment requires unanticipated technology investments for them, such as laptops. You can help. We will close the webinar with more information about how you can be a part of this important initiative. The Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series is a relatively new learning opportunity that brings you lessons of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention through bi-weekly conversations with thought leaders and business leaders from across industry spectrums. We're excited to chat with uh, Camille Gajrawala of Credit Suisse so he can share glimpses of his everyday real life challenges as well as lessons from his leadership playbook. Here to help us get to know uh, Kamil better and to facilitate today's discussion is our moderator, Tayo Akusano. Akusan, Sonia, sorry about that, Tayo. Tayo is the Managing Director of Equity Research as, at Mizuho. He also serves as the chairman of the board of Rutgers Road to Wall Street program, a valuable experiential learning program for our students. Tayo earned his undergraduate degree right here at Rutgers Business School, then went on to earn an MBA from another little known school uh, called Harvard. <laughs> it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Tayo Akusana. Please take over from here, Tayo. Great, uh, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's great to have all of you here participating on another edition of the Leadership Series. Uh, and it is uh, my great pleasure to have uh, an hour to chat with a very good friend of mine, uh, Carmel uh, Gajawala. Uh, I have known Carmel for almost 20 years now, uh, but uh, you know, I still would like to think of us as still being very super young people. Uh, we both started our Wall Street careers together at UBS, uh, you know, in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, today, Carmel is a managing director at Credit Suisse. Uh, he covers the beverage and household and personal care sectors from an equity research perspective. Uh, and again, he has more than 20 years of experience uh, in his role, interestingly, both on the sell side at the investment banks uh, and on the buy side uh, in the world of institutional investors and hedge funds. Uh, most recently, you know, he spent five years covering global consumer products at Manicay Partners, an investment firm, and uh, he's also a proud alum of, uh, of RBS class of 1998. Well, you're 99. <laughs> 2000. It's cool. Oh, wow. You're younger <laughs> than I am. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. Uh, but it's great to have you on, uh, Carmel. Uh, and uh, again, I'm looking for, forward to this one hour with you uh, to really kind of catch up uh, and give the students a lot of advice about the past 20 years. Uh, I would like yeah. to take both of us back to our RBS days uh, as a start point and really kind of yeah. you know, ask you about your time at RBS, what it was like and how much do you think the program has changed? Uh, specifically, you know, we would also love insight uh, in regards to the reputation of RBS on Wall Street uh, and how we could also work in regards to trying to get more students hired, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the street. All right. Well, I guess my experience was, and I don't think it exists anymore, but um, you might remember the Rutgers Exposure Program, where basically you work as an intern, you get three credits towards your finance degree, and if you get them to like you enough, you get, you know, you get hired uh, for a full-time summer internship, and then you can uh, ideally roll that into uh, full-time work. Worked well enough for me. It's how we got in. There was probably only three or four of us per year that were kind of getting into that and working through. Um, now that was 20 years ago. Uh, things have obviously changed pretty substantially since then. I think what happens with banks, or at least getting into banks, one of the issues is they have a lot of inertia. They tend not to want to do things too differently year on year and year 
and getting into the, the recruiting cycle is critically important. I think a lot of that has to do with there's folks on the inside that can help, but also just that engagement and reputation building between uh, the recruiting folks on uh, in the school side versus the recruiting folks at the banks. If you can get into that, if you get into that cycle, then you get to stay there. It's hard to get in, but once you're there, you're good. What has happened lately, and I think it's an opportunity, is it's really two things. One is if we think about you know the newer generation of graduates and such, there. You know, the whole lifetimes have been you know financial crisis post financial crisis moments and and you know they're looking at innovation and entrepreneurs the facebook's and such instagrams of the world and so the banks are getting less resumes from uh less resumes than they were in the past and so that's kind of one and the second thing though is banks are also trying to look for a better balance between finance and a series of things that are becoming more important inside of the banks and specifically it used to be if you were really good at the financial, at, at the actual financial components and finance fundamentals, you'd get in. Now it's you, you, you do better to or do well to complement that with some engineering background, some math background, some coding background, programming background. Um, so any way to provide an offering that suggests a better balance, because being good at finance, being good at accounting, being good at those sorts of things, uh, used to get you in. Now it's just table stakes. You have to figure out where these banks are going, and all of these banks are very substantially increasing their investments in their hiring um, with disciplines outside of kind of just that core. Um, and that's on our kind of our side of the business, which is the finance side. The other area um, where banks are making a lot of hires is, of course, on uh, with lawyers and such. And so, um, which I know very little about. It's not my side of the bank, but I think it's more about complementing is complementing the core skills than it used to be where in the past it used to be just about being the best that uh, the best in the game at just the core. Great. Uh, well, you certainly kind of managed to get through the door. You know, you've kind of spent 20 years uh, in the business now. You are now, you know, a managing director within your role. Uh, again, what would you kind of say are some of the secrets of your success over the past 20 years to get you where you are today? Um, I don't know about secrets, uh, <laughs> but I I don't have a lot of secrets, but uh, I think a couple of things that were important is, is one, always play the long game. Day to day, everything seems really dramatic. Day to day, there'll be events that look like they're catastrophic. Uh, play the long game, make sure you're kind of moving in the right direction. Uh, keep checking in to make sure that you're moving. It's easy to stagnate. Um, the reality is you're either growing or decaying. It's very hard to just kind of sit around on Wall Street. You're either getting better every day or getting closer to getting fired. So you have to make sure you're kind of improving getting better every day and moving towards a path. It's just not one of those industries where you can hang out. Um, there's very, very few people who have been able to do that. And so play the long game. Um, the other thing is, you know, connect with, connect with as many people as you possibly can, but actually care about them, get to know them, give a shit about them. And, you know, it doesn't all have to be professional, but what ends up happening over time, and maybe you and I would be an example of it is, you could have called me anytime you wanted in the last 20 years, and if it was something I could help with, I would have. But that's not how we got to know each other. We just got to know each other because we just became friends. And and I think that's the important thing. It's not about trying to figure out how to align with the right people, that sort of thing. Get as many people as you can and care about them uh, deeply enough that they can offer whatever you can. And eventually, if there's something you'll need, you'll be shocked at how often uh, what goes around starts to come around and several people have turned up at different times in my life to kind of move me uh you know into the next league up next league up next league up okay it, it sounds like you're talking a lot about you know a lot of the pillars of the of the rbs program in many ways like i mean from your comments i hear you saying things about students have to be resourceful students have to be resilient and students have to have the ability to kind of reinvent themselves over and over and over again to kind of become successful at you know in a career on Wall Street. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, the reinvention probably the most important. You know, survival of the fittest, not survival of the strongest. Uh, it's important to it's important to adapt. Um, in terms of resourcefulness, the thing about resourcefulness is the only way to really teach it is to under resource someone. So and so and then it's, it's hard to do and it's hard to actually have it but you see this often with managers is they they tend to give their uh the people who work for them their team their staff they tend to give them a lot of the answers and then get frustrated at the at the pace of development and so all those things are absolutely critical i think if you're a manager the important thing is to make sure you can get 
the actual folks that work for you to uh, to develop each of those skills, you know, just as importantly, which requires hard things. Uh, there might right. be an e easy way to do things if you're over-resourced, but if you do it the hard way, they actually learn how to do it a bit better. Um, and then again, you know, I'm talking about this, you know, this networking thing is important. I think it's important to, you know, build out a, a small group. And if anyone is looking for a, a good, this is, and this is more human really than just business, but, it, but, but businesses are basically living organisms is, um, there's a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Um, who's pretty famous for having uh, won a couple of, I don't know if they're Oscars or Emmys or whatever they are, um, of some military documentaries that he's done, but really talks about um, the benefit of being in a locker room, the benefit of being in, um, you know, he obviously spent a lot of time with the military, so the benefit of being mm -hmm. with them and then how they've built these um, these like strength in, in, in society by creating these little mini tribes and uh, the same thing exists very much in all walks of business, especially on, on Wall Street. And if you can have one that you can rely on, everybody does whatever they can for the collective good and you end up moving forward. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. So we actually got a really interesting question uh, along the lines of uh, what you were talking about earlier on, complementing your accounting and finance backgrounds with things like information technology and engineering. I mean, what are your thoughts just around how technology is changing your job or technology is changing the financial industry, uh, particularly around things like blockchain, around things like big data? Yeah, so there's where we are right now, it feels like maybe the first or second inning of really understanding how to deal with the data that is coming our way. And what you have is a bunch of finance folks that know how to analyze numbers really, really well that are using a 30 year old technology to do that called Microsoft Excel. It's just not the way to do it. And so they're not as equipped in dealing with the facts. So for example, I'm a consumer products analyst. I cover beverage companies and stuff like that. Um, here's a piece of advice for anybody. If you have a weather app that's free, it's not free. They're selling your location every single second. I know exactly <laughs> how many people walked into exactly how many bars and exactly which location and at what time. And I can get all that stuff so I can figure out as states opened up their bars post COVID, how much volume those bars were actually getting and how much volume they're actually losing. I am not as a finance major capable of actually managing that sort of data. There are more intelligent things, more intelligent people with more intelligent software and better training that can do that. But I can make an investment decision, an investment recommendation based on somebody doing that for me. And so, and that's just one example of the types of things that are now available to folks in finance that never really existed. But here's the thing that's also important because the way finance works, and maybe we don't want to make it too stock market specific, but the way that the market's worth is all the data becomes available to everybody. The market would just arb itself out and that's efficient market hypothesis that you get taught in, I don't know, it's probably in 101 when they explain that to you, but there's still humans involved in humans doing things and humans making decisions. So there's still plenty of opportunity in the markets that hasn't arbed itself out. But now there's also a bit of a data war is you know, who's going to have the most. And then if you have it right now, what all the banks are doing, they're kind of like grabbing for rock stars. You know, you grab for Mick Jagger, but like if you actually got them, what would you do with them if you had them? And everybody is kind mm -hmm. of doing the same thing with data. All the banks are trying to capture as much data as they can. They're not entirely sure what to do with it. Um, and that's where adding some of these other disciplines. That's where they want to bring people in with more data science background, coding background, and um, figuring out how to add that to their uh, to the repertoire of assets that, uh, that a bank has in-house. Okay, great. Um, so let's kind of uh, pivot over to, again, the world of leadership, because again, that's one of the critical things uh, we want to discuss uh, uh, you know, as part of this uh, series. Um, how exactly, what do you, how do you define leadership? And then specifically as a leader in your organization, can you talk a little bit about what you do to try to motivate your team to be the best it can be? Um, well, man, I don't know if I know the, the definition, but I think, at least the way I look at it, is being a leader, you kind of have a primary mission and then you have a million secondary missions. And, and they all have to work together and you need to keep this machine moving and the machine's got a series of different, you know, if you use a, a vehicle as an analogy, you've kind of got to keep that vehicle moving, but you've got an engine and tires and all these other things you got to take care of as part of the process. I think the first thing on the primary objective is to make it really simple. Make it very simple for anybody, including somebody in eighth grade, to understand what you're actually trying to accomplish. That's the first thing that people get wrong, um, particularly 
as we get into kind of more sophisticated things, people fail to kind of dumb it down. So for example, you and I are equity research analysts and we write research reports based on in-depth analysis of, of a series of different companies for me, consumer products, you for REITs uh, to provide investment recommendations. You could also just say, we try to help people make money. It's all we do, it's help people make money and help them make better investment decisions. And so everybody that works on my team knows if we're not moving towards accomplishing the primary objective, why are we bothering to do this at all? Are we helping our customers make better investment decisions? That's it. But then you have a whole series of secondary missions and starting with is what are the intentions and goals of your, of, of each of the people that work, all of the people who work for you? Because, and, and asking them and also more importantly, listening to them, I think it's easy to ask, yep. uh, but you really got to listen and there because the goals will be very different some people want to move ahead as fast as possible other people just want a paycheck um some people don't like what they're doing they're just doing it for now and and so just like really really properly listening they call it a, a empathy based listening or empathetic listening is where you're like properly paying attention but um figure that out and then figure out how to get them towards that goal what can you do to get them towards that goal and if they feel like they've been properly listened to if they feel like you're working towards getting them to whatever that goal is, uh, and I'll give you an example of some of the folks who work for me, um, then they will give you a lot more in return. Very naturally, just very naturally, you'll get that. So, um, you know, I have only, had, of, of my staff, I've only had two people move on to do what I do. But nearly everybody else who's moved on, I've helped them get to where they kind of wanted to go. One of them wanted to go work in corporate in Miami because uh, he was getting married to somebody whose family came from Miami, and we got them there at a, at a distributorship. Another person wanted to go to business school. Another person wanted to go into sales. And so as long as you help everybody go into um, where they get to where they want to go, then you'll get a lot, then you'll get a lot back. Um, other secondary missions could be things like you may need to promote your team internally, which is the sort of thing you have to do kind of if you're at larger companies. Uh, compliance now has become a very different exercise than it used to be. It used to be about being ethical. Now it's about really understanding the fluidity of changes of rules and regulations, things that are allowed that are not allowed, and things that are not allowed that are allowed. Um, yeah. So there's like a series of secondary missions, but I think it would be simplify a primary mission and understand what your staff wants to do by properly, like really properly listening to them. And, uh, gotcha. and then everything else kind of is more technical. Okay. Awesome. So in the past 20 years, I mean, it's, it can't all have been smooth sailing. We've definitely all had our challenges and, you know, and bumps in the road career wise. Could you just talk a little bit, you know, and uh, about, you know, maybe one or two instances where you did have, you know, a challenging time in your career and kind of how you got through that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, right now it's not exactly simple. Um, but you know, if you <laughs> think true. about it, like here's my time, right? So here's 20 years. I started as an internet analyst in the internet bubble. I thought I was going to be so rich, like really rich, but you know, analysts right. making 20, 30 bucks <laughs> a year back then covering the internet. Uh, I was right at the top, didn't make a cent, the internet disappeared. That was 2000. We rolled that right into 9 11, followed by Elliot Spitzer really changing the economic structure of investment banks, housing crisis, financial crisis. Um, and now we have obviously COVID slash protests. You know, we've got a lot going on. Um, it sounds like a lot, I suppose, but I think if you look at any 20 year period, you'd find the same sort of thing. So if you go to 1980 to 2000, you'll probably find a savings and loan crisis, the 1987 crash, the Cold War. Um, what else happened back then? Asian devaluation. Um, if you do the 20 years prior to that, you had oil embargoes, Vietnam. Um, you know, so each of these 20 year periods will have all of these kind of bumps in the road. But I think when you ask successful people, um, and Gladwell did, by the way, and almost all of these successful CEOs always spoke to these difficult times as time when they would learn something. They never really talked about, hey, I'm really successful and here's why. I was doing great and I went from great to better. It was almost every instance when they learn was when times were hard. And so I guess we've had a lot of these bumps in the road, but we've learned every time and keep your eye on the long ball and it should work out okay. Great. So it's always use each of these uh, challenges or, or challenging times as a, as a learning opportunity, more so than anything else. Yeah. All right. People Great. also remember. Uh, I think it's just sorry very quickly is that people remember how you behaved 
during a difficult period more than they yes. remember how you behave generally. And so if you can be a voice of optimism, if you can be a balancing force, if you can show a little extra maturity or help people out or whatever it is in the hard times, people will remember that for a long time. And that gets back to my networking thing, I guess I mentioned earlier. Great. Uh, and then just again, you, you did bring up a couple of things. Again, it's a particularly challenging time today in a world of COVID-19 and the pandemic. You know, we also have the protests. We have the Black Lives Matters movement as well. Um, what kind of leadership role do you think companies should be taking in regards to these two issues? So I guess the first on COVID-19, I don't know if we need to talk a lot about the safety stuff, because of course, every company will do everything they can based on the information available to them. At least I assume most of them, most of them will. And of course they, of course they should. Um, what's the second level discussion as it relates to COVID? I think that's a lot more complex. So for example, you may have people who are willing to take a 1% risk of death in order to work. What decision do you make uh, as a company if your folks have something that they actually want to do? Uh, that then becomes you know, a lot trickier of an exercise. And this is when it really comes down to listening to your folks and try to get a good understanding of where they're coming from and what they mean. Um, the other thing though is, this is also a time where uh, and I'll use kind of Jamie Dimon as an, as an example. He spoke, uh, Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan, was talking about how it took him five years to get about 10% compliance with DocuSign electronic signatures. They then went to 100% compliance in two months during the COVID crisis, which shows this is also a time where, because I mentioned banks having inertia on recruiting, organizations have inertia in how they do things, and they don't challenge the status yeah. quo very frequently. This is a moment in time where every aspect of the business is being challenged. And it's a chance to really structurally improve various parts of your business where that can that frankly can be done much better. Five years to get to 10% for electronic signatures going to 100% in two months. No reason they couldn't have done that a year ago or two years ago, mm -hmm. but instead they did it in two months because they had to. It's kind of like if you under-resource people, you'll find out how resourceful they can be. And so right now that's what we're doing. We're figuring out innovative ways to do business. And in the end, I think if companies are showing real leadership beyond obviously you have to keep everybody safe and you have, there's a lot of things you have to do. And I don't really have anything to add because it's obviously the most critical thing. But once we get past that, if we can get past that, it then comes to what are the things that we've uncovered that can lead us to be a better, stronger organization going forward. And that's what companies really need to be spending some time on once we get through the kind of shock event and once we get through understanding appropriately the safety, I think that's when we need to move and say, well, what are the things that we've been doing wrong that we can just uh, fix or do better or, or what have we uncovered? And here in the real estate space, I think one of those will, uh, real estate will be one of those areas, you know, and, and empty offices is mm -hmm. one of the first things that many companies have been kind of bringing up to figure out like, yeah, do we really need all of this real estate that we have? Are there other ways to do it? And then we'll see. Yeah, I mean the 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 the, the pandemic definitely uh, is creating uh, these uh, these situations where I do think it's going to be one of these times when we do have rapid change in regards to how uh, Wall Street uh, you know conducts business going forward. Um, along those same lines as well, again talking about again we just talked a little bit about the Black Lives Movement. Uh, we just kind of had Pride Month uh, last month as well. Uh, what do you think about general diversity? you know, in regards to the investment banking industry? Is this something you think the industry still needs to work on? And do you kind of think, you know, you know, the current atmosphere also kind of creates a, a catalyst for change? Um, I mean, definitely. This is what change looks like, right? It's, uh, it's not always pretty, the process, but it's, this, is, this is the process. Uh, by the way, I'm speaking very much as myself, not as a spokesperson for Credit Suisse or, or anything like that. We are very, you know, of course, Credit Suisse is doing a series of things, but um, rather than just repeating the stuff that they're the corporate stuff, we'll just talk about how I'm thinking about things. Um, like there's a long, it certainly feels like there's a long way to go as it relates to you know diversity across all a whole series of different, um, a whole series of different um, uh, you know ways and methods. I think the first thing that what, what Black Lives Matter, and not just for banks, but even for the companies that I follow and such, what it has what it is, it has gotten them to do is to honestly and forcibly audit their activities. 
I think many of these companies maybe thought they were doing the right thing or didn't really know any better, maybe whatever it was, but now they're looking and thinking about it like very properly. Some of my companies, which are in the consumer space, you know, are looking at their advertising. They never really thought about their advertising as seriously, the platforms where they're advertising, how they're advertising. Um, the other thing is, hey, you know, here's, a, here's an easy first audit is, what is the diversity of your workforce in comparison to the, um, to the applicants for those jobs? You know, or do you have, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about blacks, for example, is it 10% uh, of applicants and we have 5% staff? Like, what is exactly is the is the number? And I don't know what it is at investment banks, but I think that's your first piece. Your first audit is okay. Are we even even there? Um, and and I don't know the answer. But then the second piece is, is if we are even there, what then is the difference between the lower level ranks, junior level ranks, and the senior level ranks? Because is there then another layer in there that we're not thinking about where there's attrition for, you know, for some reason? And again, every bank I'm sure is different and I don't know uh, specific figures. It just feels like there's a long way to go. It feels like there's room to move. I think if there's an, if there's a, if those things both identify a problem, the first thing probably, the, 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 the kind of response I'm, I'm seeing from many companies is, oh, okay, well then, you know, we need to have a we need to have a, a diverse CEO, or we need to have whatever. Yeah. It's like, hey, you need to be careful there because you don't just start at the top. There's like so many different things. I know there's always these comparisons of a number of women CEOs in the S&P 500 or something, but it's it's kind of there's those are 500. There's only 500 of those jobs, and there's 150 million people working in the United States. I think the important thing is to have a, a wide enough pool of people so that you're feeding it enough, so that there's a better pool, so that you create the diversity, not just to, focusing just on the top is focusing on all the things that come to build yourself up to there because mm -hmm. you can't assume that we can get to 2021 or 2023 or 2025 and all of a sudden you've got you know 200 female CEOs what you have to do is figure out if you want to get to that 200 what is the actual path and what's the path of the yeah. folks that have gotten there and that's where it feels like for there's a lot of improvement to be made in many organizations is to really kind of figure out how to do a better job and if any organizations are listening to me i'm sure you probably feel like maybe yours is doing a bit of a better job i've noticed and when it comes to talking about diversity everybody feels like they're doing above average um but the, but if you look at the numbers in average it doesn't always seem Let me to get that, yeah. um, yeah. so i think it's about developing a pool we need to have a bigger stronger pool and there's a couple things you can do to audit yourself honestly to figure out if you're you know how far off sides you might be yeah Excellent. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about mentorship, uh, uh, kind of as well. Like in your 20 years, you know, how important has mentorship been to you through the process, uh, and and what advice do you actually give students who are in school today? You know, in regards to trying to get a mentor uh, to help them in regards to their overall career development. Um, I love the men. I don't. I don't. I don't love the mentor thing idea as much because I feel like it implies there's a single person, person that can get yep. you there. Um, I'm more a fan of like building out a tribe, building out a network, uh, different people, different things. Uh, and as my example, you know, one of the bosses, one of my earlier bosses that I had that you know, Caroline Levy, best one of yeah. the best bosses I've ever had in my life, very much taught me about how to kind of manage a team for collective good and everybody will do better. If everyone can just work towards a collective plan, then everyone will do better. That was a good learning experience. But then when I worked on the buy side for five years, that person really taught me how to properly understand how to analyze companies, how to be skeptical on what you're seeing, and, and also to pay attention to, if you understand how people are incented, you will understand how they behave across mm -hmm. every walk of life, but especially if you're analyzing companies for a living. Okay. Very different sort of thing. Um, and then I remember during my financial crisis, we we're like, wow, this is the worst thing in, in a really long time. What do I do? Um, the solution usually is called somebody that's much older than you and say, what is going on? Uh, which I did. I called a guy by the name of Greg Frankfurt, who's still involved at Rutgers at LIBOR. And he was like, hey, Greg, this GFC thing sounds like a really big deal. Like, well, how should I think about it? And he basically was like, well, let me tell you about May Day in the early 1970s. I think it's 72 where they deregulated commissions on Wall Street, which were 30 cents a share, and they immediately started to plummet. And banks were firing people all over the place and everyone was leaving the industry. And it looked like the end of the world if you worked at a bank. And those that stuck around made a fortune because you went into about a 25 year bull market following that moment. Yeah. 
And he basically said, look, now it's time to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And whoever, a lot of people are going to leave, your competition is decreased. And if you invest where everybody else, or said in Warren Buffett terms, be greedy when others are fearful, as opposed to being fearful when others are greedy, um, you probably do better. And that moment was a painful moment at the actual period of time, um, but a step function moment in my career. So it's different people for different different things, um, as opposed to trying to just kind of find a, a single mentor. Um, like how do you get them? So how do you how do you get them? Is it's a harder question, but I do find that most people are good and interested in helping others, especially if they feel like they're having an impact. And and that first sort of thing is ask a lot of questions, but properly listen. I mean, I see this with junior folks all the time is they want to show off all the things they know. They want to show off all they know. They want to show off. And sometimes you can't even get a word in. You're like, hey, man, it's like, that's cool. You're impressive. But uh, like, like, there's a lot to learn, too. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not old, but I've been around. Right? <laughs> I don't think I'm old. Uh, I don't have an old person's hat on, at least. <laughs> but, uh, but, but um. But I think like if you when you engage with folks, see what you can offer, try to offer something, listen, right? Uh, um, the one thing on this empathetic listening, empathetic listening, uh, and if anyone wants to get a crew, clue on how to do this better, uh, and this kind of changed how I thought about it as well, there's a guy by the name of Eric Maddox. He is the interrogator that got the information that led to the capture of Saddam Hussein. Um, he's done, he's, he's all over the internet. You can find stuff about him. The best thing to listen to is a one hour podcast um, by Patrick O'Shaughnessy, O'Shaughnessy, who does the Invest Like the Best podcast. The first half hour is how he engaged with the, uh, his prisoners. The second half is how you can use that in investing. So it kind of puts these two things together. But the way he pulled it off is he's meeting with these people who hated him, and he figured out how to really listen to them, really understand their goals, and help them accomplish their goals so that he can, so they can help him find the bad guy, find the ace of spades. Um, I think you could look up Ace of Spades, Eric Maddox, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Invest Like the Best to Find It, if you like, something like that. Um, but it'll, it tells you about how listening makes a big deal. And if you want to build out the network of mentors and stuff, it has to start asking a lot of the right questions, really properly listening to what they have to say and figuring out if there's something you can offer back. Great. I like that idea of building a tribe. It definitely takes a village for sure. Yeah. Um, so let's kind of go back to good old RBS. Uh, I think, again, you did talk about reinvention probably being, you know, a critical piece uh, of, uh, you know, of being able to be successful, you know, on a career on Wall Street. But again, when mm -hmm. we kind of do think through, again, the, the four pillars at RBS, resourcefulness, resilience, reinvention, responsibility, uh, reinvention clearly seems to be the top of the list for you. Uh, I'm just yeah. kind of curious how you would rank the other three pillars in regards to their importance uh, in, in in building a um, successful Wall Street career. Well, man, I don't know how to rank them. These are like choosing between children. These are pretty good <laughs> kind of things. Like if I choose resilience, does that imply not responsible? Uh, <laughs> uh, I thought we agreed no trick questions, but I, I think I think what. Uh, I think the main the, the, the main thing is to not forget about any of these things and and to to think of them you know proactively like where exactly are you in the continuum of some of this stuff and um you know when's the right time for resilience well probably not in the middle of the bull market where everyone's making a fortune when's the time for resilience is to compare difficult periods of time like now to periods in time in history and the resilience you've done i think sometimes resilience people look at as a mental thing one more rep, one more rep, run a little farther, run a little faster. I can do it in my brain. I can be resilient. There's also fact-based resilience. You could also look at periods of time in history and say, look, this has happened before, right? These moments are not necessarily unique. Humans have basically been the same for 5,000 years. By the way, not to give too many recommendations, but I will anyways, <laughs> but um, there's a book. I think it's 30 years old, maybe 40 years old. It's only 128 pages. It's called Lessons from History. Yes. And it basically summarized lessons from 5,000 years of history into 128 pages, general kind of easy to read. And it will show you how a lot of the things that are happening today are not that different from what's happened many, many times before. And the best part about the book is it's an old book. So they're not trying to take a 
you know, a pro Trump, Trump uh, or, or a no Trump position. It was 30 years before he was a president, right? So, um, but it just shows you how these these things have happened. And you can gain a lot of resilience from pattern recognition from history. I had to call somebody who I knew had been around in the 70s and explain May Day to me and why the GFC wasn't going to be the end of the world. Um, you know, kind of early, when you think of Black Lives Matters protests and stuff like that, I think I might have been a freshman during Rodney King and a sophomore in college, freshman in high school, and then um, sophomore in college maybe during like when OJ Simpson and all these sorts of like these things have been turning up for a long time. There's not all it's not all of a sudden it's the rate of progress, but mm -hmm. you can be resilient by understanding history a little bit better as opposed to being resilient just by trying to will into it like how I try not to eat carbs. It fails every time. But <laughs> uh, fact based resilience, I think, is very, uh, very important. Resourcefulness we talked about just under resource yourself. You'll find out very quickly how good you are. Um, and but you can't it's really hard to let go of an easy way to do something when it's available to you. You figure it out when you have to. Um, and on responsibility, beyond just do the right thing and beyond the fact that, you know, you should feel like you're a fiduciary to a series of people who are impacted by your performance. Uh, on Wall Street in particular, it's become harder and harder to know precisely what the right thing is because the rules have become very tricky. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's about understanding the rules more carefully. Um, and it's also about thinking about perception uh, a little bit more important. Like even if you're doing the right thing, but it could, it could be perceived to be the wrong thing, um, that could have an impact on you. And, and more importantly, everybody that works you know, for or with and around you. Uh, and so you just have to take it a lot more proactive because if you believe you're just a, you know, overall good person. That's fine. I, everyone believes that doesn't mean you can't make a mistake. Gotcha. Awesome. So I didn't answer uh, your question. I talked a lot instead. So <laughs> what you get? <laughs> that's what no, you I, get. For the students where, again, this is a summer of uncertainty, you know, whether they're a freshman or, you know, or, or, or a junior, or, you know, it's a summer of uncertainty. Some of them might have their internships pulled. A lot of them, the internships have kind of turned virtual. Some of them are doing the in a different type of internship that versus what they really wanted to do. I mean, what what do you advise those students to kind of you know to kind of make the most of the summer, such that they're still getting an experience that will count uh, when ultimately they are trying to pursue a career on Wall Street? Yeah, look, uh, innovate, innovate, innovate. You're in many ways under resourced. That's what's gonna happen, it's too bad. That's the reality of this year. Um, so if you think about, for example, if you're not in a physical, since you don't have a physical internship, and this is one of the things where companies are gonna have to be very careful with remote working. I know everybody's talking about how remote working is the future. We have to be very careful with what that, the impact that has on your junior staff because Absolutely. many of them learn from watching and witnessing. So make sure that you know part of your job is also to learn as much as you possibly can from everybody around you. And so you're going to have to engage them more proactively because it's not going to happen by accident in that same way that it used to. Um, and rather than just asking for time, asking for time, asking for time, figure out if there's ways where there's something that you can offer. Is there something you can work, you're working on that you can explain to someone else? Is there um, other ways that you can engage where there's something you can do that helps them, um, helps it feel like more of a relationship building exercise as opposed to feeling just like an interview? Um, it's not going to be easy. There's, you know, things never are, but I think if you're very proactive about the, your reality, and it's kind of very important, is to like don't feel far, feel sorry for yourself. Just embrace the new reality and figure out what to do about it. And because I think there'll be, from a competitive perspective, there'll probably be a lot of students that aren't as proactive, aren't thinking about that in the same way, are just kind of letting it roll and hoping it works out and things kind of fall into the favor. Because yeah, there used to be a process. You get a summer internship, which usually ends in an offer, and then you really get to enjoy your senior year because you know what you're going to do before you start at school, or you started your final year of school. That might be gone, and so you're going to have to do it a different way, but I would do it very proactively, very aggressively. You'll have to work a little bit harder maybe than others, but that's okay because at the same time, the competition probably is working less hard, and that's good for those that want to step it up, and Wall Street really only wants those folks, the ones yeah. that step it up and show, hey, yeah, Last year was awful. This was a really difficult exercise. And here's a series of things that I did to figure this out and make it work. 
Great. I mean, and you know, if the student ultimately does have the opportunity to kind of work for you or work for me uh, as, as, you know, as they kind of start their first job, I guess, what are the kind of things you end up looking for, you know, in their first few years that ultimately uh, will give them an opportunity to kind of move up the that move up the ladder? Usually the first, well, first of all, attitude is my first and most important thing. And I, oftentimes you could figure that out in the first three to five minutes of a meeting. Uh, is do they have the right attitude? Do they have the maturity to learn? Um, because I'm not really that interested in precisely what you know right the second, but I want to know that you have the fundamentals necessary to learn whatever comes your way. So if you're somebody like myself covering multinational companies, sometimes click Cook as an example, they find they're in 70 functional currencies. Sometimes you need to be a currency expert. Other times you need to understand the impact of aluminum cans or you need to under the cost of aluminum. You need to understand commodity costs. Other times you need to understand, hey, what does the market care about plastic in a bigger way and what's that impact on Coke? There's so many different things that you have to learn just to do what is a simple goal of ours, which is to help people make better investment decisions. And based on that goal, I don't necessarily need somebody who's an aluminum expert or a currency expert. I need someone who can learn whichever one of those things that comes up that's important. And the ability to, I guess this comes to reinvent in some ways, maybe not directly, but the ability to do that is what moves people up the ranks because whatever comes their way and we don't know what it's going to be next will be the sort of thing that they'll be able to figure out and thrive at. Excellent. Um, that is great. Uh, I think one thing we would like to do at this point is maybe kind of open things up to the live audience questions so we can get uh, a sense of what others out there would like to ask you, Carmel. Yeah, sure. Uh, operator, could we do that? Sure, absolutely. Right, yeah. yeah, so I've been sending you um, the questions that the audience has been um, you know, shooting, shooting our way. Um, and if you can't see them, I'd be happy to read off some of them. But if you can see them, you can, uh, can feel free to do that. They've been great right, questions, by the way, everyone. Yeah. I have gotten uh, quite a few. So let, let's kind of go right, uh, right to the tapes. So one good one is that we got uh, is what are the top three areas that the banking industry is being impacted by COVID? And specifically, you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, your area of work in regards to equity research, how, you know, COVID may be impacting your business. Okay, so I guess the first thing, there's going to be multiple waves of impact, by the way, uh, to businesses, economies, uh, banks. The first wave, of course, is that what happened with staff. Now, certain roles uh, like investment banking and like my job in equity research, it's actually seemed to work just fine in a complete remote structure. Um, but we also have trading floors where people would yell orders over to each other across a, you know, the six flat screen panel monitors yep. that they have. Um, they had to figure out a very different way to work. And that uh, when you're trading and it's about seconds, and it's about facilitation and it's moving large amounts of dollars, that is very, very hard to do quickly. Um, and so there's, it's, you know, because of the shock of the effect, it was a little tricky initially. It's getting better. Um, but I think there's, I think that's an issue that's like needs to be resolved or something that needs to really go back to, you know, back to full time and how do we work it out? That's maybe the first thing. Second thing, we're going to have to watch what happens on the banking lending side of things because there's a very different type of recession when the government shuts you down and says no business cannot work and when things are open but nobody has any money to spend you then go into a very different type of recession and that's a different i don't know when precisely that's going to come because obviously we're in many states we're still shut down and some states are getting re-shut down and we'll see what occurs but um we're going to roll into a different recession and that recession uh, banks will have to deal as they will deal with things with recessions, which means a higher amount of uh, delinquent loans and all the things that that come with that. Uh, so that's that's peace. Uh, that often means less capital markets activities. Companies don't want an IPO in the middle of some of those types of things. Um, in equity research specifically, one of our jobs is to, as I mentioned, help other people make money, help our investing clients or our, our uh, uh, institutional investors make money. Mm -hmm. The hard part about my job and Tayo's job at the moment is there is a lot of unknowable things and our customers are asking us questions on how to navigate the, uh, how to navigate the process, but there's just a lot we don't know. Um, for example, 
I am shocked at how much beer America is consuming. Because when uh, I knew that when they were going to shut down the bars and restaurants, which are 15% of beer sales, I knew that, of course, more people are going to buy at grocery stores and then more people are going to. Um, so you'll see the shift from bars and restaurants to grocery stores. But I'm also thinking there's no sports, there's no music festivals, there's no conference co uh, concerts, conferences, all these sorts of occasions where people typically drink more than they normally would, um, would have a serious impact on overall alcoholic beverage consumption. And the reality is it has not. Um, Corona Modelo, for example, just reported earnings yesterday and their sales are up five and a half percent. And that's with 15% going to zero. And so uh, there's a lot of unknowable things. And in that environment, I think it's a little hard for us. So what we've done is a lot more scenario planning. Here's a series of if-then statements. The following things occur, here's what it means for everybody. Um, where in the past, you might be able to lay out the most likely event, the most likely scenario. Absolutely. Uh, another good one from, uh, from, a, uh, from the audience is, you know, what would you say is your proudest achievement in your career and why? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, so we had a guy, um, wasn't from Rutgers, but was from a school similar to Rutgers, surrounded by all the IVs, struggling to get in, worked for us for free and uh, to get his credits towards his finance, uh, finance major. And then uh, the summer came around and he says, hey, I'd like to stay. And I said, yeah, that's definitely, man, let's, uh, let's stay. And so, of course, like all bureaucracies, it goes through this process and they come back and say, um, he can he can stay but we can't pay him and i was like well okay that's not great I talked to him he's like i'll do it anyways he was very enthusiastic wanted to do it and then um and then but and then there's all these like kind of cool internship programs that at the time this was ubs would have got you know meeting with senior leaders all these types of things and they said you can't include him in that either i was like well that's not cool that's just an extra body in a room like what is going on and uh create enough of a fuss to break through the bureaucracy where not only was he included in those things, but they had to pay him, but then they also had to retroactively pay him for the time that he didn't work. So I basically got to call him in and say, hey, look, you're in and we owe you a bunch of money. And so, uh, and now you're on the road to, and by the way, he's he's been very successful. And uh, you think you know who he is, but I'm not gonna mention it here. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, giving back is a, is a, is an important oh, part. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm losing. I'm lost sound. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Do I? Yeah, I can hear I you. Mean, lost sound somehow. Stand can you by. hear me? Hello. Hello. Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Get me? Let's yes, I can again. hear you. Can you hear me? You can hear me. I can't hear you. Should we use sign language? <laughs> uh, where did your sound go in? Damn it. Let's try this again. You hear me at all now? Yes, I can hear you. No, not at all. Say something, mate. I can hear you. I'm waving to you. One more time. Oh no. Uh, let's see. Where else can I go to check sound? Stand by. Testing, testing. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Damn it. Try again. Can you hear me, Kamal? Nothing, nothing from you. Where would it have gone? Um, meeting. I heard something, say something again. Hey, Kamal, can you hear me? There, there you are, I got you now, I've got Excellent. you now. I Excellent. don't know what happened there. Sorry, man. 
No worries at all. You know, that's that that's that's part of being resilient, right? <laughs> that's tech. Yeah. I thought we we're gonna have to use carrier pigeons. Uh, talk about being under resourced. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, well, uh, particularly sorry to Margaret because she probably was just freaking out. Uh, yes, I can't yes, quite I see was. You anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yes, cool. Well, yes, sorry I was. That. Yeah, no worries at all. So I was just saying that I think it's great that you know you consider one of your best achievements the ability to actually have given back and to actually mentor someone, uh, uh, which is great. And I think it's advice that uh, we always kind of give, you know, recent graduates. It's never too early, uh, uh, you know, to start to give back, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, especially uh, to RBS. Um, yeah. So I would love to ask you another question uh, from a student. Uh, who asks that, you know, you know, traditional college education is great, RBS is great, but what else do they need to be doing in regards to their overall level of knowledge to really compete successfully for Wall Street jobs? Um, well, it's always impressive to see somebody who's been good at a variety of different things. So if you find, you know, a, a resume from somebody that has done three or four unrelated things and happens to be great at all of them, that usually means there's an underlying discipline or an underlying ability to learn that um, means they're like they're, they're very likely to be successful. Uh, so it's something I always, I always like, you know, like to see. Adding kind of side disciplines, as we talked about, I think also obviously very important. I think when you, you know, competing with a bunch of other finance majors is one thing, but if you've got programming, coding, math, any of that along with it, it just puts you closer to the top, um, especially because you have to kind of keep this in mind. It's a good time to be a recruit in that most of the people you'll be interviewing with will be very deficient in all of those things because people like me will have graduated with a finance major trying to be the best finance person and i'll be deficient when it comes to you know this new environment new world so i'll be looking at somebody to complement my um what you know what i've been doing for 20 years with something that i've not done before so if i was hiring someone 10 years ago or when i was hiring someone 10 years ago it's very different. Now I'm looking to hire somebody who is an expert at something that I know very little about. Yep. And so it's a good time to be coming out if you can complement your kind of core with a few other things. Great. So this, so to you, this is the time for the, the, the classic finance major or accounting major to learn a little bit more about AIS, to learn, you know, to kind of take a couple of classes in BATE, for example, at RBS, to really kind of complement yeah. that, that, that finance background. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, by the way, that's underplayed but important is I'm shocked at how few folks, particularly in what kind of inequity research and such, but you often find people with really good technical ability that aren't able to distill it down into uh, and communicate clearly the actual purpose of the things that they're working at. In some ways, maybe experience gives you that, but in other ways, um, you have to be able to write well. You have to be able to communicate clear. Not communicate a lot, communicate clearly, uh, explain complex things in simple terms. When you could do those sorts of things, it um it makes you very different. It sound it sounds um, just it puts you on a different planet than someone who's got all this technical stuff. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, and before we kind of hand back over to Margaret to wrap up, uh, again, just uh, one question that uh, is out there is specifically for the class of 2020 graduates. Uh, again, just kind of, you know, they're graduating in a COVID world, you know, what advice would you be giving them at this point in regards to, uh, you know, how they should be, you know, thinking about their future? Um, well, I mean, the first is, I suppose the first is, and we talked about this earlier, you're only ever going to learn anything when times are hard. And so if you're going to go through a difficult period, and, and, and we talked about how every 20 years, there's multiple instances of hard times. And now is a hard time. Hard time's a good time to start. Hard time's a really good time to start. Um, and I think, I know, it's, it, it, I know it stinks and it really doesn't seem fair because it's not. And, you know, I feel bad for you. A lot of people feel bad for you, but you don't really need to feel bad for yourself because I think in many ways, you will come out better and stronger than you otherwise would be. And there's an, it's an economic piece and a social piece. And the social piece is, as has always been the case with young people, young people want to institute change because they see the future 
you know, right around now is when you start to take ownership of your future. And you don't quite have the keys to the castle, but you might have the keys to the Ferrari. And you're kind of like, okay, how, which direction do we want to drive this thing? And we're in the process. Like if you, if you study history, we're in a, there's these moments of time where there's these like kind of step functions of change. And we're in one of those moments now, and you may or may not like kind of the direction, but one thing is for certain things are going to be happening differently in coming periods. And companies are auditing themselves very careful, carefully to make sure that um, things are fair. And it's a good time, I'd say, socially for change, even though the process just sucks. But it doesn't mean it's not a good time for uh, what's happening from a social perspective. Um, from an economic perspective, again, looking through history, these sorts of crazy crises moments, they've happened many times before. Yes, this, this one's related to a virus. The only thing that the fact that this is virus related, it tells you how hard it is to predict what the next big crisis, like what's gonna bring the next big crisis, but it doesn't mean we didn't just have one 12 years ago. And that one, everybody said was the worst one in a really long time. And <clears throat> now we've had the next worst one in a really long time. Um, but the reality is it also, economically speaking, works as like a little bit more of like a forest fire. It clears out a lot of the underbrush. A lot of the kind of weak hands um, start to disappear. And it's a really, really good time to start. If you start, you will end up going into a forest that's growing and a forest that's healthier in businesses that are better and businesses that are thinking about things uh, more intelligently because they were forced to. And so I get it, you know, and I, and I want to be kind of sympathetic that I, I, I totally get that this is not ideal, but it doesn't mean if you've looked at these moments in time in history, it's not actually a very good time uh, to be young and to be coming out, even though it doesn't work as smoothly or nicely as you want to. I can promise you a bull market you come out in a bull market, like I did, that rolled right into the internet bubble in 9-11. I basically went from thinking I was going to be incredibly rich to not knowing what to do with myself in short order. And so you do better to come out after. And then uh, you'd have better perspective on things and better organizations around you. So I think it's a good time. It's better than uh, it feels, uh, other people feel sorry for you, uh, and, but you shouldn't feel sorry for yourself. And, and if you need, any proof about that is just study history a little bit and see where we are. Uh, and you'll see this is actually quite a good moment. Great, that, that is extremely good advice for not just the class of 2020, but I would say for all the current students out there as well. Uh, Kamal, this has been great catching up with you again for another good hour. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you too, man. We, we appreciate the time. RBS definitely appreciates the time. Uh, we continue to kind of wish you all the best with the rest of your career. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for participating in this leadership series. Yeah, man, definitely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Um, uh, you did give me uh, quite a scare. We joked about that in our um, green room, but um, <laughs> I don't know. We were I testing your resiliency. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there are a few gray hairs, I think, with your with your name on them. <laughs> but thank Sorry you so about much. That. Um, you made it uh, a fun, um, you know, as as you prepared our audience for with your title, um, and we we really uh, we really enjoyed it. Very very insightful. Lots of um, recommendations from your playbook and so forth. So. Um, that was great. And um, you used a quote that I really like. Um, this is what change looks like. Um, so I, I like yeah. it a lot. Um, but our audience, thanks for sticking with us through uh, um, your little audio challenge there and for providing some fantastic uh, thought provoking questions to enhance our dialogue. Um, wanted to deliver as promised on the information about the 1000 uh, laptop challenge. This is a new component of our signature leadership series, our leadership series. Students and their families have endured financial hardships um, since COVID-19 rocked our worlds. They quickly entered a remote learning environment that required technology such as laptops that they simply can't afford. Corporate sponsors, promotional partners, and individual contributors can help by donating to the 1000 Laptop Challenge Fund. You'll receive an email with more information about how you can be a part of this important initiative, and it will include a link to the donation webpage. And we um, greatly appreciate your support there. Um, a friendly reminder to everyone listening that the RBS Signature Leadership Series takes place bi-weekly on Thursdays at noon Eastern time. 
And we have an exciting schedule of business leaders lined up to sit down with us over the next several months. Um, here's information about the very next one, but if you wanted to uh, look at the upcoming schedule, you can see it at business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. We email it to you too, because that's a pretty long URL. Um, we want the series to continue to meet your needs, so please stay online with us for just a moment longer as the webinar ends, because you'll immediately see a very brief survey about today's event. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and email to you, and it will also appear on the Business Insights page of our website. So um, everyone who is part of our presentation um, on the front end, the back end, and our participants, thank you so much, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Take care. Yeah.